Happy Friday, and welcome into iHeart STEM. This week, I want to talk about how information moves around the world. Today, 95% of global data and voice communication is sent via underwater cables on the ground of the ocean. It's the fastest and most reliable option. But this is a hot area of engineering where companies like Google, SpaceX, and others are looking at expansion, improvements, and alternatives. Let's discuss global telecommunications of the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge style. You're watching iHeart STEM. Today, we'll tackle one STEM topic I learned from experts. Just four key questions with each answer under one minute or less. Underwater cables have been around since the 1850s and were first used for telegraph cables. It took a few attempts to get it right, but in 1858, they could finally send messages from Europe to North America in just minutes. The first transatlantic telephone cable was completed in 1956 and was a type of cable called a coaxial cable. Coax cables are made of copper wire surrounded by insulation and the copper carries an electric signal which gets translated at the receiving end. Now the engineering of the cables along with the other technology required to make them work, devices to boost and amplify signals, have limitations. So in 1988, fiber optic cables took over and there are 570 transatlantic in use today. Now, traditionally, fiber optic cables are glass strands about the thickness of human hair that have a glass core center surrounded by another similar but different layer called cladding and then a protective layer. The light travels through the core and carries data by transmitting light and pulses that represent a binary code, which is converted by a device to and from electric signals. Because light travels fast, fiber optic cables are the best method to support the amount of data we want to send. First fiber optic cable was put into underwater use. We've got to remember the internet wasn't even a thing. Then in the late 90s, people had to use dial-up internet. I know all you young ones out there can't imagine, but this is where you needed an actual phone line for your computer to connect to the internet. There's obviously a lot more demand to send information since then. So to enable this, engineers first evolved fiber optic subsea cables by improving the transmitter technology that's at the ends of the cable, which since 2010 has resulted in 10 times the available capacity. Without getting too technical and remembering how data is sent, engineers and scientists realize that because you can adjust light's brightness, where it is in a phase, and send it in different ways, you can come up with more combinations of how to send the light, which means you can send more data. More fiber pairs within a cable are another way to increase how much information you can send, but because you can't increase the overall cable size without impacting other parts of the process, there's limits. So now the focus is on engineering different types of fiber cores for additional speed or more data in two primary ways. A hollow core is where there is an air center and a multi-core is where there are multiple cores within a fiber. When you think about it, the concept of putting cables into the ocean seems a little crazy. The ocean contains a plethora of plants and marine life and also sits on these big rocks called tectonic plates that move over time. These rocks are the same rocks that cause earthquakes, tsunamis, just to name a few, and they can also be extremely rough and jagged. In addition, the cables themselves are only about the thickness of an outdoor hose or hula hoop. Interestingly enough, if installed correctly, the cables become adapted into their environment in just a few months, and only 10% of interruptions to transatlantic communications come from nature. The rest Rest of the time it's caused by human intervention and that's what's driving engineers to push for alternative methods of communication. Most of the damage caused by humans is from boating activity, anchors, fishing, going over cables in a shallow area. As an example, Houthi militants hit a cargo ship in 2024. The ship dragged its anchor as it went down and damaged three subsea cables which carry 25% of the internet traffic from Europe to Asia. It could also be from intentional sabotage which while rare is a huge vulnerability today. Regardless of the cause, this happens often and costs in the millions so is a focus for the future. Because of the need to explore global communications out of water, there's a new focus on finding methods to optimize where data is sent and when to introduce better redundancy, like NATO's trying to do with Project Heist. Most businesses utilize the concept of redundant connections, and the idea is if something fails, you have a backup plan to reroute information on another path. Today, you can do this to some extent by rerouting to other cables, but there's a renewed focus on exploring beyond cable redundancy through satellites. Satellites' use in global telecommunications has always been limited due to the speed of data it can send. Cables can send about a thousand times more data than satellites. The reason is data has to travel to and from the satellite, there can be weather conditions, it sometimes even has to hop between stations. One of the newer ways they are looking to increase satellite throughput is by using lasers as part of the satellite network. NASA says using lasers encodes data in photons at near infrared wavelengths rather than radio waves to communicate between a probe in deep space and Earth. Put in English, this means that instead of sending radio signals to satellites, they can send lasers. And because they are using near infrared, it removes some of the previous obstacles they face, like interference and precision. 
There is so much more information out there on this topic. So make sure you check out our page. We've added in a couple links. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you're wondering, did I match my outfit to this topic? Absolutely. I'll see you next week.